everyone can see the presentation. Yeah, you can see it. Yeah. Yes. All right. Awesome. So, uh, hello everyone. Thank you for uh, joining. Uh, I'm gonna be. Um, my name is Bashar Abdullah. I'll be. I'm the founder and uh, sole owner of Remote Game Jobs, a job board focused on remote work in the game industry. And the focus of this presentation is remote work in the game industry, uh, how to find jobs, how to apply the best practices and the red flags maybe you should look out to. These are the topics we're going to be covering. We're going to go over the how we, uh, why did I create remote game jobs, the birth of remote work in the game industry, good, bad, the finding remote work, red flags you can come across, uh, how to create your resumes, portfolios, best practices to apply, how to get noticed and improve the odds. Just a little about me. Uh, my name is Bashar Abdullah. I'm from Kuwait. I'm a programmer. Uh, if anyone's interested, I work on Ruby on Rails. Uh, my skills is kick off too. If you know this game, you're probably too young to know it. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur and I hate commuting. I hate paperwork, which is what pushed me to work from home for over 10 years. Uh, how I'm from Kuwait, so probably a question I get asked a lot is how did I end up running a, a game job board? Uh, initially, I started 2015 working on an idea to build a platform that's like ArtStation, but to bring all the talent in the game industry in one place. So artists, composers, programmers can all come and show their work and connect with each other. The site was called skirmish.io, and you can see some screenshots. After several years trying to grow it, it wasn't going uh, as fast as I hoped for. Uh, this is, by the way, if anyone was interested, we created a uh, award-winning one-minute uh, promo for the site. It was pretty good, and the voice acting cost me a lot, so give it a look, <laughs> even though the site shut down eventually. Uh, what's happened is the pandemic hit in 2019, and around that time, before it hit, I was thinking of ways to bring jobs to game towns because I noticed this was the most important thing people were looking for when they joined Skirmish. And by February 2020, the lockdown started to happen and I started seeing a lot of tweets on my uh, timeline like this. I lost my job due to COVID, don't have a lot saved, I need a job quickly. And because relocation is hard, everyone was looking for remote work. This is just uh, an example, it's not a real person, it's not a real tweet, just a uh, disclaimer. So I was about, around that time, I was constantly working on a job board idea. And when this happened, I thought, let me make this a job board for remote work in the game industry just to help during the pandemic. So April 2020, I launched the initial version that this, this is a current actually look at the job listings. But uh, pretty much that's how it looked. Uh, before the pandemic, remote work in the game industry was very rare, especially in studios that release big hits. In fact, if you would make a list, it would be something like this, literally. It would fit on a very small note. Uh, very, very few studios that are known had uh, proper remote work. Uh, the studio that, okay, it's loading by itself. Uh, the Moon, Moon Studio who, that uh, released Ori and the Blind Forest actually is one of the few studios that are popular and started remotely before the pandemic, way before the pandemic. And because that's unheard of, it's a GTC talk by itself. Uh, I'll share the presentation later. You can look it up on YouTube. You can watch the presentation. After the pandemic, this is the list. Initially, when I was looking for remote uh, for studios hiring remotely, studios were still reluctant. They're trying to figure things out. So I would search for four or five hours a day and find one or two studios that are hiring remotely. Soon after this, uh, the list grew so big. But everyone almost said it's just temporary. Like we're going to get back to uh, the studio once the pandemic is over. 
uh, the majority were like that, which is why I added a tag about 400% remote jobs, which means it's permanent jobs. This was mainly in 2020. 2021, uh, several things happened. Studios started to realize this is ongoing and actually remote work does work. So if we look at the jobs on remote game jobs alone, in 2022, we've had 215 jobs posted so far. 96% of them are remote permanently. So 96% of the studios don't want the uh, employee to come to the studio even after the pandemic, which is mind blowing. This is a look at some of the studios that are posting with us, just some of them, and we're only two years old. And the list keeps growing and you can see some big names like 2K, Team 17. These are some big studios that are opening up for remote work as well. So remote work is here to stay and it's gonna keep growing. Here is why. First, let's look at it from the studio's perspective. First of all, achievement unlocked, remote work. Before the pandemic, studios did not believe that you can uh, run a studio remotely. It's a creative process and you need employees around each other. The pandemic pushed them into the remote work side. And right now we're seeing studios share their success stories, share their best practices. We see tools coming around to help the studios uh, bridge the gap. So a lot of studios right now are comfortable with remote work and the newer studios have success stories and best guidelines to follow. So that's no longer an issue. Also the cost to bring an employee to your region, especially if you're in an expensive region like LA or San Francisco, you have to cover the cost of relocation and you have to pay them salaries that match the area you're living in. Another thing is it's a lot faster and easier. If you find a talent you like, you're happy with each other, they can start work tomorrow. You don't have to process visa and uh, wait for them to arrange their stuff, uh, leave their apartment, move all their stuff. It's a lot faster and easier. Also, the talent pool is a lot, lot larger. Even big studios like uh, Blizzard struggle to uh, hire lead uh, senior uh, roles because the talents usually have families, they're settled somewhere and relocation is hard for the entire family. So this opens up the talent pool. And studios can pitch it as a perk, like you can work remotely. So that's a perk that doesn't cost them anything. And unfortunately, that's something also that needs to be mentioned is it's safer. Uh, we've seen a lot of uh, hostility, sexual abuse, unsafe work environments that if you've heard the Star Wars game from uh, Quantic Dream is being delayed until 2027 or 2028, big part of the reason is the studio is unable to hire. And that's also a big part because of the toxic work environment. Uh, I hope remote work is not just an escape. I mean, I hope studios would improve their work environment. But until it's really safe, uh, people who don't feel safe working inside the studio might be willing to consider working remotely from their own safe home. And because studios like Quantic Dream aren't able to land the talent they want, they're gonna be forced eventually to look into uh, hiring remotely. Them and other studios are moving in that direction. Again, I, I hope the work environment improves. Uh, remote work should not be the solution to the toxic work environment, but that is what it is right now, unfortunately. Uh, remote work is awesome for us can uh, employees, of course. Uh, it gives you worldwide opportunities, especially people from marginalized places where there is, the game industry doesn't exist. Right now, they can work with any studio around the world. It's flexible. A lot of studios don't mind if you work outside hours, if you work your own days. So that's a huge benefit. You work from your own convenient space. You have your own kitchen, your own bathroom, your own home setup instead of a small cubicle, perhaps. It's safer, as we said. And it saves you time and money from commuting and the gas prices, which are insanely high right now. So that's a welcome advantage as well. 
But um, I'm saying that as someone who had worked from home for over 10 years, there are drawbacks and we need to be aware of them. Isolation, uh, not everyone can work well in isolation, uh, especially not for long periods of time. Uh, it, it's gonna start feeling lonely at some point. And there isn't that, you know, when you're working in the studio, you just come across someone and see what they're doing and the sharing of knowledge is a lot easier. It moves a lot faster. So if you feel yourself being isolated, uh, be aware of that. Try to go out, try to go to gatherings, see if the studio will arrange some physical meetings every now and then, usually they do that. So these are important to keep you active and more socially connected. As I explained, uh, knowledge transfer doesn't happen organically. You need to actively seek it. So usually they have a Discord room or Skype, for example, or whatever tool they have to so where people can pop in or there are some tools like water cooler it's called it tries to simulate the water cooler experience at your work location where you casually go and chat with someone see what they're doing see what you're doing and transfer the knowledge uh, another problem is your home is your office and this makes it a problem when your work starts like seeping into your personal life because your office is still there and you'd say, let me just reply to this email or let me just work for five, 10 minutes. And the problem is you never completely shut down and you're constantly in a mental state of work. This can wear you down after a while. Distractions, if you have uh, wife, kids, or if you live in a busy uh, apartment, these distractions can be a problematic. So try to build an office that's isolated, uh, quiet, and people know, understand that you are in, at work right now, even though you are home. Different time zones, not all studios are completely flexible. So a lot of the studios would say we want overlap with our hours. In Kuwait, for example, our weekend is Friday and Saturday, which means if I work with a US company that wants me to work their days, I will only have one uh, day of weekend with my family which isn't convenient at all. So when you're applying to a remote job, see the time zone they want, the days, if your weekend is different. I know your weekend is the same with the rest of Europe and the US, but if that becomes an issue. And uh, the holidays, for example, if you're very family oriented or you wanna be around your friends in holidays, are they gonna be flexible with you around that or do you have to stick to their holidays only? And unfortunately, to be honest, uh, hiring remotely is harder for juniors because studios, the training juniors is harder remotely. So they're usually looking for more experienced people. That doesn't mean they don't hire juniors, but it is harder and we're gonna get into how you can improve your odds and get noticed uh, for potential jobs. Remote game jobs and where to find them. Well, first of all, remotegamejobs.com, of course, duh. And luckily right now, almost any job site you go, it will have a filter for remote jobs. ArtStation, for example, they have a remote. LinkedIn, you can filter for remote. At Twitter, uh, I'm gonna show you some uh, queries you can use. Discord, uh, there are a lot of servers. There isn't a filter for remote, of course, but a lot of servers have job channels inside them and a lot of them are remote. Facebook as well, although I find the search feature a bit confusing, but you can also uh, use Facebook and go to the different groups. I wanna just give some examples about how you can use Twitter if you're not aware. There are two popular hashtags, which are game jobs and game development jobs. Uh, you can constantly go and find uh, new jobs posted. A lot of the jobs posted use these hashtags. Some people don't, and you can use advanced queries. For example, you can search for game artists or 3D artists, and then between brackets say hiring or hire or looking, and then another bracket remote or remotely. This will bring you tweets that have the word game artists and hiring, hire, looking, and remote or remotely. So this will catch the tweets that don't use the uh, proper hashtags. 
something to try as well. Uh, since there is a long list, I'm not going to spend time listing them all. Uh, this is uh, David. His, uh, I can share a link uh, to his tweet. But if we go to his profile, his pinned tweet is a link to his document, which lists a lot of tools, remote job sites, global studios, salaries. It's very helpful. So keep it bookmarked. Keep checking it out. Uh, now, as starting getting your first job in the game industry is hard, I would recommend you look into starting as a freelancer. And the first, like, low-hanging fruit is Fiverr. Although Fiverr is uh, going to be more for the lower uh, paid job, it's still a good a place to start gaining some experience, get some revenue coming, build your portfolio, and build more confidence. I would advise you against posting this portfolio on your LinkedIn and uh, resumes, for example, because it would give the employer an indication that they can hire you for less because you're on Fiverr. But still, uh, go to Fiverr, uh, especially in the beginning, you want to have some cash coming in, uh, pay part of your bill or pay your bills. Uh, then once you're more comfortable with Fiverr, you can move up to Upwork, which has uh, higher paying jobs usually. And another site I would recommend to look into is Arc. Arc, uh, they vet their developers and they do tests for them. They say only 93% or 95 pass their test. I'm not sure how accurate that is, but Arc is more prestigious. So if you say I'm a developer on Arc, it means you've passed the test and you at least uh, have specific set of skills that they approve of. Uh, when you're applying for remote jobs, these are some red flags to look out for. Not necessarily, uh, it means the, it's a scam, but it's a red flag. If the team is anonymous, that's to me a huge red flag. If the team isn't uh, saying their name, they don't have a LinkedIn page, nothing. Maybe it's a very new studio, maybe it's a small studio, but it's a huge red flag. So if you see a job listing for a studio that doesn't exist on LinkedIn or anywhere else, either skip it or take the time to inquire who are you talking to. Don't send any information before you know who's, who you're talking to. If they refuse to share that information, then you shouldn't be sharing your information as well. Uh, they use a personal email. I've seen legit studios with good games use personal email. They shouldn't, but it happens. It doesn't necessarily mean it's a scam. But that's also something to look out for. If they don't have any sites, social media, LinkedIn accounts, that's uh, something uh, to ask about. If they ask you for financial information, social security, credit cards, banking, for home address, this is a huge red flag. Don't give them any of these information. If they ask for upfront expenses, they make up a story like, well, we need just $50 to uh, enroll you or something. That's a scam. Don't do this. If it sounds personal, for example, if you go to Reddit or some Discord, and the person seems to be telling a personal story like, I'm finally working on my own game uh, for my own finances. This is usually a sign of a hobby project that's not going to go so far. So uh, proceed with caution for these things. Uh, if the job listing is full of program grammatical errors, this is usually a bad sign. And if they make an instant job offer, like once you approach them like, yeah, we want to make an offer, why? It, this should make you question why are they are instantly offering a job. And if you're unsure, try to Google the studios, try to Google the founders. For example, I've seen a tweet last week about uh, a founder that keeps approaching artists and apparently he was sexually abusive in messages or something like that. I read that thread. And so if you're, if you're feeling unsure, try to Google, try to ask on Twitter if someone knows the studio or try to ask your connections. Do some research before uh, moving forward. Now, 
when you want to apply, of course, you want resumes. Your resume should not be more than two pages for fresh grads where you don't have a lot of experience. It probably should be less, maybe one page, one and a half. Use professional looking email. It can be Gmail, but like have it, uh, your name, not something like uh, badass uh, laser eyes or whatever. So use professional looking email. Have a good layout of your resume. This is an example, for example, on the left of very condensed cramped resume. I see a lot uh, resumes like this and it makes it harder to read. So give it a breathing space like the one on the right. I would personally uh, argue that don't use progress bars because it's pointless. Uh, you can't, for example, be 100% unity. That doesn't make any sense. So uh, I, I'm against the progress bars, but the layout itself is clear on the right. What else? The objectives. When you write your resume, uh, state your objective of what you're looking for. For example, to join an indie studio where I can use and improve my experience as a Unity and AI developer. Here you're clearly signaling that you're looking for indie studios, that you are mainly a Unity developer, and you have an interest in AI. So if the studio is looking for someone with AI experience or AI interest, that will instantly give you higher chances. Something you should not be doing is this. I am highly motivated, team worker, fast learner. It really doesn't mean anything. I, everyone says that and it doesn't mean anything. I can't quantify it. Um, I mean, I'm not gonna hire someone who is not highly motivated. Uh, I think this doesn't add any value. And focus on your core skills. For example, if you are a low poly 3D artist mainly, that's your area of interest and focus. Just mention it. I've seen resumes that go like this. 3D artist, developer, Unity, game design. I have no idea what I'm hiring you for and I com immediately ignore such resume because it seems the person is going in so many directions, not sure, not finding his skill and their skill in one area only. Uh, try to show what's more relevant and important uh, to, the, uh, to the studio. Highlight your milestones and achievements. For example, winner most innovative college game awards. Uh, these things would, would matter. So any milestone you have, any achievement, highlight it. Especially right now, you're still fresh out of college, so you don't have work experience. Show these things. And use action verbs when you uh, speak about what you did. For example, develop all the art for the graduation project or designed all game mechanics and levels of the game. This tells me that this is what you did. Uh, if you say, for example, responsible for all the art, uh, are you are responsible, but did you do it? Did you do a good job? This tells me that you developed, you did it actually. As I say, don't put progress bars, please. Uh, this is a bad practice. And it's okay to adjust your resume per job. For example, if you are a 3D artist, and one time you're applying for uh, low poly 3D arts, another time for voxel art, and if you're good at both, it's okay to adjust your uh, objective and try to focus more on your the area of interest for them. Not that you're lying, but you would highlight this skill that they're looking for. And at the end of the resume, it's okay to show your personal interest that might be, uh, that might show your character. For example, if you're someone who likes to travel or learn about ancient mythology, something. It's okay to share, show these interests. Sometimes it would make them interested in your character. So also, beside the resume, you need an online portfolio where they can quickly go and see your work. This doesn't apply probably uh, easily if you are a writer or a producer, but especially for artists, designers, programmers. Why would you need it? You, you need to, as I said, you need to show your work instantly. You can, if you are at a conference like GTC right now, if you're lucky enough and not stuck here in this presentation, you could instantly show someone your work. You would be discoverable 
because if you share your portfolio, for example, on ArtStation and these sites, people can find you. Uh, it makes you look more professional to when you're showing your work as opposed to just a resume. And your nephews are gonna think you're awesome that you have a portfolio. They're gonna show it to your friends at school, like, look, look what my uncle has. Uh, where to showcase your portfolio LinkedIn. It's not uh, like very well designed to show your art, but I've seen people that show your art, their art also on their uh, page. And it helps me get uh, initial impression about the kind of work they do. Art station, of course, if you're an artist, uh, I know not all artists on art, uh, on art station, but I highly recommend you be there. Post your best work. You never know when someone is gonna come across your portfolio through there. Instagram is a great place also to show your work. GitHub, if you are a programmer especially, that's a great place to post if you have some uh, code you wanna put as open source, if you have a project that you've built and you don't mind sharing it on GitHub, it will make people uh, see your work and quickly judge your skills. SoundCloud, if you are a composer, for example. And you can also have a professional portfolio, so I take it to the next level, which I also think is a good idea. And here is why. Having our station, Instagram, makes, people, makes you discoverable and people can quickly see your work, but having your own portfolio site on top of that, not in its place, will look you even make you look even more professional you can put it on your business cards, for example. You will have better control on how to present your work, how to present your uh, portfolio, how you present yourself. And it will be more memorable if your site stands out. I will remember it more and I will show an example uh, in the next few slides. And as I said, this will look good on your business cards when you have, instead of artstation.com slash Bashar, you would say, Bashar, the artist, for example, dot com. That would look a lot better on your business card. Where would you host your portfolio site? There are a lot of places. Of course, the most popular is WordPress. Everyone knows it. Other options are Squarespace and Wix, which gives you uh, what you see is what you get. Editors, drag and drop, you can easily build your site. And GitHub Pages is also available and it's becoming more and more popular. You can host your page there for free as far as I know, and you can even add your own domain, which I think is high, highly valuable. Some tips to building your uh, portfolio site is make it direct and concise. I've seen portfolio sites, they start with a long paragraph text telling their story and I have to scroll down to know what they're looking for. Make it direct and concise. People are busy looking at a lot of portfolios. So quickly grab their attention. Show your work instantly. Don't make me scroll to see what kind of work you have. Focus on your core skills. As I said, if you are a 3D artist, show your 3D art. Even if you know some game programming, you are trying to show your 3D art skills. So focus on that. And mention clearly what you're looking for. For example, if you're looking for freelance work, part-time work, if you're looking for a full-time job, make that very clear. Uh, put your contact information very clear, easy to find. And make sure the portfolio site is fast and easy to load. Don't overload it with very heavy images on the main page that takes a minute to load or uh, it's not optimized for mobile, for example. But make sure it's mobile friendly. Otherwise, quickly people will quickly jump, close the site, and you've lost a potential recruiter. Also, make sure you have no ads on your portfolio site. Usually it costs five or $10 to remove ads if you're using one of these platforms. I think GitHub doesn't have ads at all. And if you can use a custom domain, uh, it will be much more memorable and looks a lot more professional. So it's worth investing in that. In that. This, for example, is a portfolio site for a writer. She works, she writes for games and other topics. It's really stood out to me. I connected with this person through LinkedIn and I looked at her site and I love so much about it. For example, let's 
look at it first. She created her own name, Fisklet, which is a unique brand name for her. And then from the top, she clearly says, get real leads from authentic content. So she's stating clearly what she can do. Uh, below that, you can see book a free consult, uh, consult content templates. So she's pushing forward the two actions that she, you can take, what she can provide. And the next, if you scroll down a bit, she introduces herself, one or two liners. She highlights her core skills and what she can provide. And she shares uh, a review of her previous work. So this made it memorable, even though she's a writer and it's a lot harder for a writer to show her work, she spent the time to present herself. One week later, after correcting with her on LinkedIn, I came across a tweet, someone was looking for a writer and she instantly came to mind because of her portfolio site and I shared the tweet with her and she applied. So this, this is the kind of site you wanna have that makes an impression, makes it memorable. Uh, now you have a job, you find a job that suits your skills. Before you apply, before you hit the apply, a lot of people jump, hit apply, some of the resume. Some tips before you take that action. Read the description, please, for God's sake. I've had a lot of studios tell me half of the people applying didn't even read the description. They don't meet the criteria, they don't know what the job is, or they didn't submit the required papers. If they ask for a cover letter and you just don't submit it, you're immediately disqualified. Some people have automatic filters. If they ask for a cover letter and your email doesn't have an attachment, you are immediately disqualified. They won't even look at it and tell you to send it again. They receive hundreds of applications. A single job listing on remote game jobs can easily get over 100 applications coming through it. So imagine someone posting on ArtStation. You're competing with thousands of others. So uh, HR don't have time to go through every email and reply to you politely and saying, please read the email and send the cover letter. You're disqualified. You lost your chance. Also, before you apply, do some research on the studio, uh, where they're based, how they work, uh, the tools they use, the games they've released. Look at the team members, uh, gather some information about them. This will help you build uh, more knowledge when you submit the cover letter and when you go for the interview, you expect it. So you can better position and uh, promote yourself. Uh, before you apply, try to see connections or connections of connections. And the best place for that is probably LinkedIn. See their team on LinkedIn, see if you know someone that knows them or someone that worked in the studio, someone that knows someone that knows them. See if you can reach out, get any piece of information about the studio. Say, I'm interested in a job. Can you give me uh, some information? Would it be possible to introduce me to one of the team members? I have some questions before I apply. Do that with people you're comfortable with, you know, and you never know, it might, it might really pay, uh, pay back. Uh, as I said, follow application guidelines. If they ask for a cover letter, a resume, and a specific subject uh, style, follow that. If they say you have to write 3D artist job, colon, and then write your name. Follow that to heart. Otherwise, you might be disqualified. So take time to read the job description, read it again, do the research, read the, uh, see if you can find connections and more information before you apply and cover letters. Yeah, I know a lot of people hate cover letters, but once you've accepted cover letters, no one can use them against you. I've seen a lot of people like real pain because of cover letters, but I like to look at them as an opportunity to uh, present yourself, promote yourself and stand out from the crowd. Uh, here's some guides about filling up your cover letter. It should be three paragraphs all around that. You will list your accomplishments in the cover letter. You will show your skills. Don't tell them, don't say, I know Unity. Show your skills, say, I built the, this game uh, jam project using Unity, for example, or show any milestones you have. 
So the first paragraph of a cover letter, usually you would identify the position you're applying for. And we will go through an example after that. So you would say, I'm applying for the Unity developer position or the 3D artist or the game designer. Second paragraph is you try to bridge your resume skills with a job requirement. So if they are looking for a 3D low poly artist and your resume has a certain set of skills, one of them is the 3D low poly artist. You would try to bridge the, uh, bridge, uh, the resume with the job requirements and show how your skills can help them uh, accomplish the job they need. Brag about achievements, don't shy from that. Any milestones, any stats, if you've worked on the graduation project, game jams, you won any awards, mention that. This is the place to show it, so you would get higher chance of getting an interview. The third paragraph is you make the pitch. And I'd like to take the Cloud Punk uh, game as an example. Uh, I don't know, I'm not sure if you play that game. It's a beautiful voxel based game that looks like uh, it's Blade Runner. Uh, say you're interested in that game and you're applying for a 3D art job. So you would go, dear Mr. Ben, I am going to apply for the 3D art position at Ion Lines to join the team working on the sequel to Cloud Punk, the Notice, notice what you've done here. First of all, you've clearly stated the position you're applying for, and you've indicated, you highlighted the studio name. So clearly you didn't just hit the apply button and submit uh, your resume, you know the studio and the game. And you mentioned that you wanna work on the sequel to Cloud Punk, which would emphasize that you know the game and you know Nivalis is the sequel to Cloud Punk, which would suggest that probably you played that game or you know what it is. As opposed to, I would just like to apply to the 3D artist position. It just shows that you want the job but you didn't show them that you know what they're doing. So several things here you're emphasizing. Second paragraph is you try, you try to bridge the resume to the skills they need. As a recent graduate of Arc Academy, I have a strong built foundation and game art skills I have gathered through the intensive two years program at the academy. So you're uh, mentioning that you recently graduated from Arc Academy, that you have a strong Art Skill Foundation that you went through intensive two years program at the Academy. And then I managed all the art for our voxel based graduation project and have thereafter dedicated most of my time to honing my voxel art skill. Here you're emphasizing your accomplishments to manage the art of a voxel based graduation project, assuming that was the project. So you're telling them you worked with voxel. And after that, you put more time and effort to hone your skills in voxel art. So you're clearly showing them that you're someone who is interested in the kind of work they're doing. You've done a project before and you're using your extra time to develop that skill. That's a lot different than just saying, I would like to apply to the 3D art position. It shows you've done your research. It shows you know what they want and it shows you're offering your skills to help them. Remember, in the end of the day, you want the job done. So show them how you can help them, why you are the best candidate. And this is where you make your pitch. I think I'm a good fit with Ironlands. I look forward to discussing my background and experience with you soon. And what I can bring to the world of Nivalis, I can be reached by email anytime at your email or by phone, if you're comfortable sharing your phone. Uh, sometimes sharing the phone is good. So here you're making your pitch that you think, uh, don't shy from, away from that. If you think you're good, say it. You think you're a good fit for, with Ireland, not just because you want the job, but because you can contribute with your experience and you will show them your experience through the call. So you're here putting a call to action. Let's have the uh, call, let's have the meeting. Let me show you how I can help you. This is an example and I followed the uh, uh, template from uh, the book called Job One. I will uh, add it the references at the end of the presentation. I highly recommend that book. It will help you a lot, guide you through your job application process. Now, things go well and you get to the interview stage. Few things to keep in mind. Show up on time. Don't come late. Don't come exactly on time. Try to come a few minutes early. Show them that 
five before uh, and during the for the meeting, whenever they are. Try to have proper setup mic lighting. Don't like invest hundreds of dollars in a mic or lighting, but remember you are applying for a remote job and they expect to have frequent calls with you. So if you have a bad connection, uh, some studios will give you a setup fee to get you set up, get your office set up, but this will still leave a bad first impression. They might be worried that your connection is not so well or it's not gonna give the best impression that you're ready for remote work. So even with the slightest modest budget, you can get, for example, an LED light to have proper lighting, and uh, decent mic, that would uh, be in your favor. Uh, show your knowledge about the job, the studio, and the team. Let's take the cloud punk, for example. Uh, take time to discuss the game, what they did. You can ask about how what they're doing with Nivalis, for example. Are you going in a different uh, direction? Are you taking it to a different city? What sorts of changes are you bringing to the world? Whatever they can share. You will show them that you're invested in the project and you're, you are interested in the technology and the art, for example, behind the game. You can ask about the studio or how big is the team, how, how they conduct their remote work, the best practices, how they, for example, tackle the issue of isolation. This would show a level of maturity that you're interested in becoming part of the team, not just getting the job and getting your paycheck. And uh, as I said, show them what you can do to the company. If you have a portfolio, share it and show them how this relates to the work they have. Show them how we can contribute to their uh, to their game and ask questions as I said don't shy away from asking questions uh, about the project they have about the kind of work as I mentioned it's not just okay it's expected that you sh you ask questions actually uh, this is one tip I found I wanted to share on Twitter this guy is hiring for juniors and he's specifically saying that Share your work, talk about what you were trying to achieve with it. And if it relates to the studio's work, highlight that as well. Hiring entry level developers is about investing in person's growth. I don't expect perfection, I'm looking for potential. So with your portfolio, when you show them what you can contribute to the game, they know you're fresh grad, but you have a potential. Now, you have a resume, you have your cover letter, you are applying to jobs. Unfortunately, get ready for a lot of rejection and get ready for a lot of no response. That does happen. Uh, keep going, don't feel frustrated. It can be hard in the beginning. Once you get your fist foot through the door, it gets easier. Meanwhile, you can do a lot to improve your chance of getting noticed. First of all, connections, connections, connections. I can't emphasize this enough. LinkedIn is the first place I would go to to connect with industry professionals. If you have a conversation with anyone online, offline, ask if it's okay to add them on LinkedIn. If you go to an event, uh, take business cards or ask if this person is on LinkedIn, try to reach out to them later and add a note so that they remember you, say, hey, I met you at the uh, gathering or the conference. I would love to uh, join your circle if it's okay. Uh, there are a lot of online events as well. And it's okay, for example, to reach out to me or other people you connect with. This is helpful for many reasons. Uh, for example, is, let's say you connect with me. Now, me and you are growing our circles. If I see that you're looking for work, you post that you're looking for work, and I just click like, this will start showing your post on a lot of people in my feed who might be interested because I have a lot of recruiters following me. Or you might, for example, see that one of your friends is a second connection with a person of interest. And this happened to me when I was running a skirmish. I wanted to reach voice actors, and I saw a producer I know who knew a voice actress. I asked for an introduction. She introduced me, and the person was the most kind and sweetest person you can think of. She introduced me to tens of voice actors, and I had a lot joining the site just from that connection. Uh, sometimes, even especially, I mean, especially during COVID-19, when physical events aren't as common, 
Uh, a lot of people are okay, even with connecting with people in the industry that they don't know. Just don't spam and understand that some people may not like it. But a lot of people, if they say that that your portfolio is really your game developer and you want to connect, you wouldn't mind, they will just accept it. I usually accept connections if I see the person is within the industry. If I don't see them clearly from the industry, for example, they don't have a clear title, I would ignore it because I don't want connections that just bring spam. So that's one thing to keep in mind also. Make your profile clear that what you're doing, what you're looking for as well. Make buzz on social media. Please share your work. Don't shy away from it. Use Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. There are, of course, the screenshot Saturday hashtag, portfolio day, game dev, game art, a lot of hashtags. Use them frequently. Try to, every week, post something new. Post your progress. Show what you're doing. Uh, YouTube, for example, if you've built a level design a environment or level, show it on YouTube. If you're comfortable with showing tutorials, uh, show, show them. If you're, for example, trying to replicate uh, some game, uh, you can show it on YouTube, show how you're working. This will give you more credibility and get you followers, get you noticed. TikTok, I have no fucking idea how TikTok works, but I assume <laughs> younger generation know how TikTok works. My daughter, she's 11 and she has over 1,000 followers, so <laughs> it's easier to get there and it helps with the reach a lot. Uh, explore TikTok, especially if you have something visual to share. Discord, of course, there are hundreds of uh, game development Discord servers. Join them, look for ones that cover your niche, show your work, uh, give advice, join events, and ask for feedback as well. Don't shy away from asking for feedback. I've seen a lot of artists show their work, get feedback, and keep improving it over months. Uh, now, how to improve your odds of getting jobs? Learn complementary skill, and I will specifically speak to artists here who are at a disadvantage. Usually, game programmers need to know game engines, but they're not asked to learn Blender, Maya, or any other art tool. Artists, however, a lot of the jobs require that you know a game engine, Unreal Engine or Unit usually, or they will give you a preference if you know that game engine. So if you are an artist, take the time to learn Unity or Unreal Engine and try to show your work, show that you've built that 3D model or 3D environment and you've brought it into Unreal Engine or Unity. This will help you a lot, especially if you add it to your art station, for example, and LinkedIn. When people go and filter for, I want a 3D artist that knows Unreal Engine. If you don't know Unreal Engine, you will, you will not be found in this search result. So learning an extra skill that complements your skill will play in your favor. Uh, build the habits of doing weekly challenges with specific goals. For example, I've seen, I think Game, Game the Maker, uh, YouTube channel, I forgot the name. What he did is every week he tries to replicate a uh, game concept. So for example, say you want to replicate the portal gun or you want to replicate the Mario World gravity. Every week, take a very small challenge and build a small prototype. And the end of the week, you will develop better skills and you will have work to share on social media and I add it to your portfolio as well. As I said, you, this is uh, something to add to your portfolio on social media. Also, there are a lot of 3D artists. There are lots of, for example, programmers, but if you specialize in something, Say if you specialize in VFX or real-time physics or AI, UI, UX, or VR or voxel, this will improve your odds. Uh, there's nothing wrong with being a 3D artist. But if I'm looking, for example, for a voxel 3D artist, which is becoming more and more popular right now, and you can show me that you're good in voxel art specifically, you will have much higher chances. Uh, VFX jobs take a long time to fill real-time physics even more. AI, it's not as common. So if you are a Unity developer and improve your skills in AI, you will have much higher chances filling these AI uh, jobs. So look at something you're interested in. 
inside your skill and dive deeper into it. This will make you stand out for these more specific jobs. And if you're really interested in studios, there is no shame in contacting them very politely. Uh, don't contact, time contact all studios. Take time, uh, contact the few that you're really interested in, show them your work, how it's relevant, and say that you would be interested if there are any job openings, even if they don't have any job listings right now. This might uh, help in the future. For example, uh, Marius Fitzek, I really don't know how to pronounce his last name, so I apologize to him. He was a recent graduate artist, and he wanted to work with Double Fine, so we actually created a mini game where he's coming to apply to a Double Fine job, and if you know Monkey Island, he's mimicking the beginning of Monkey Island where Guybrush Deepwood is walking into an, an island and he wants to become a pirate. Uh, and guess what? He did get the job. He got an intern job after he went. They hired him again remotely. And he continued working on the uh, Double Pine Adventure game, which became uh, Broken Age. So you are in a creative medium. Be creative. Try to think of creative ways that you can show yourself and improve your odds. Uh, for example, applying for Cloud Punk. Build a scene with voxel art and approach them and say, I did this fan art uh, based on your uh, Nivalis world. If you ever have an opening, I would love to be considered. They, they might be really interested or even if they are not hiring, they might recommend you to another studio that's hiring for this. Uh, at the end, I want to share some resources. Uh, getting noticed. This is the first video I saw, which really inspired me to focus on uh, building a skirmish. It's a uh, talk by Jacob Minkoff, who worked uh, as lead designer, I believe, on Uncharted 2, the uh, train theme, if you know it. Job 1 by Phil Blair. This is uh, the book I spoke about. I read it, and it taught me a lot, even preparing this presentation. So I highly recommend everyone to get this book. It's not long. You can finish it in one or two days, and it will give you a different perspective. I don't necessarily agree 100% with everything in it, so don't hold anything against me in that book. But it's a great resource. Everyone should get it and read it. Uh, get noticed and get hired. That's another GDC talk you might look into. I haven't seen it personally, but I found it, and I thought this is very relevant. Uh, this is an article I wrote long ago after going to GDC. If you go to any convention, conference, I'm not sure if business cards are still a thing, but if it is, uh, after the conference, what do you do with all these business cards? Don't just discard them. Take the time, go through these business cards, make a spreadsheet, a Notion template or whatever, write the names of everyone you met, write some notes about who they are to remind you, like this is the person that was working on a, a 2D side scroller. He might be interested in an artist later on, for example, and reach to them on LinkedIn, connect with them, introduce, uh, send a follow-up email if you're interested, like, hey, it was nice meeting you. Uh, I'm not sure if you remember me. I sent you a request on LinkedIn. This will uh, keep you in their mind, and if they have any, you have a higher chance of uh, being approached. But also, don't approach it just as a business contact. Try to make friends because this is what really lasts. Uh, I've made a lot of connections, but I've made some friends and these friends were still in touch and we still have help each other out. I asked them for feedback and they helped me as friends, not as just a business contact. This is what you should cherish. Try, don't try to approach people at conferences as business contacts. It doesn't leave a good impression. You will be much happier and it will pay back for both of you to build friendships. Uh, this is an interview with Joanna Giordano. He, she's a career coach and she's sharing what goes behind the scenes in an HR department when you apply. So this will give you a perspective about how your application, when you say, they didn't reply to my application. Here is from her, see what she has to say. She, see what goes behind the scenes. And this is five top tips when applying for jobs in the game industry by Chloe. It's a Twitter thread. 
it's also helpful. I recommend you go through it. That's what I have. I hope it's been helpful. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask, or you can email me at any time, please. I'm happy to answer. Uh, yeah, hi, I have um, a question because um, I saw a recording of a conference done here in Bulgaria uh, mm -hmm. last year, I think it was, and uh, the guy that was running the conference said something that is uh, uh, somewhat different from what you said earlier, so okay. I just wanted to get kind of a, a, a better understanding. So uh, basically one of the questions that was directed at him was, um, I have no idea how any of the, let's say, game engines, Unity, stuff like that work, but I mm -hmm. am a great artist. I have a very okay. solid background. I've done amazing things, you know, uh, mm -hmm. and I have a very solid portfolio, but I don't have uh, um, any background whatsoever with any of the programs. And I think that is the reason why I haven't been hired yet. And uh, okay. bas basically the guy said, uh, if you're that good uh, as an artist and you don't know anything about any of the programs and you're just beginning uh, to learn some stuff, uh, mm. we will teach you everything you need to know and that will not be something that stops you from finding a job. So how true is that, if it's true at okay. all, and what are your thoughts on it? Sure. Uh, first of all, one thing to highlight, and uh, this is something I should have mentioned in the presentation, uh, I haven't heard a single person on Twitter or anywhere else that says, when they got hired, they met 100% of the requirements. Usually, it's not even 90 or 80%. Usually they would say, we want someone with five years of experience in Unity and they know, for example, some AI. Usually they don't find what they're looking for. This is what they have hoped for. And if you're good enough and cover, for example, 30, 40%, and this is an advice, do apply don't shy away it's okay not to meet all the requirements usually you will not if they see you good enough uh they will hire you and they will rely on you being able to fill the rest of the gaps so well his point is correct that's why i put this under improving your odds if you are a really good 3d artist as i said a lot of artists don't know game engine so if i'm looking for someone that's a top-notch high quality 3d artist who knows Unreal Engine. These aren't so common and probably cost me a lot more, so maybe they are outside my budget. So if I see you're really good, but you don't know Game Engine, I might make a compromise. And some studios don't have that requirement as well. But that's why I say it would improve your odds because let's say two artists are the same level, but one of them does know Unreal Engine. I think this, will, this person will have uh, bigger advantage. That's why I say it improves your odds because I've seen a lot of jobs that ask, we want Unreal Engine experience. They say they want it. Some of them say preferred. Some of them say they want it. So even the ones that say we require it, maybe they will compromise on that. But if they see you having it, that will give you an advantage. I, I hope it makes sense. Uh, yeah, it made sense. And also one final question. I don't want to take uh, no, no, time from I'm everyone here. else. Uh, so basically jobs that require uh, some sort of uh, background in the game industry, but we don't have any, we're just starting out. Should we apply for them as well? Or is that a waste of time if we have no uh, experience before that? Yeah, uh, probably not senior or lead usually, but uh, for once, a lot of jobs say we want one to two years experience. Very few jobs, like uh, if I would tell you the last three months, we've had perhaps 15 top junior roles. So a lot of the studios don't say we want to hire a junior because they want someone that can help them and they don't have the time to train, especially in these studios. But especially ones that say one to three years of experience, they don't mention we want senior. Uh, I would say prepare a good portfolio. That's why I would say, for example, keep learning, uh, do a challenge every week so they can have a portfolio and tell them, yeah, I haven't worked professionally, but I'm a graduate and I've been honing my skills and this is my portfolio. And uh, if you're good enough, they will probably give you a shot. They're not gonna say, it's, they're putting this requirement because they want someone who can do the job, not because it's, it's a rule, but it has to be followed. It's, uh, it's what they're hoping for, but 
I would say definitely go ahead. Otherwise, you will have difficulty getting any interviews. So especially ones that say one to three job, take the time, uh, see if you can prepare something more specific or put, invest time in the cover letter to show why you still can help them even though you don't have the one to three years experience. But yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. It yeah, was very helpful. I hope so. Thanks. I have a question. Sure. Uh, what advice can you give to people who are unsure of their skills and are a bit too shy to put themselves out there and start applying? Okay, uh, excellent question. Uh, lack of confidence is a big problem. I, I'm not gonna lie, I personally struggle with this as well. A lot of times I feel I'm not good enough. What I would suggest is go to Discord servers, go to Twitter, go to Instagram, and show your work. There are a lot of channels that ask for, ask for feedback or work in progress, portfolio. Show your work there, where usually it's friendly. These communities usually are friendly. And you will get honest feedback. If there is something you can improve, you will get that feedback. If it's good, they will tell you it's good. Uh, this will give you the initial boost of confidence that, yeah, actually, it's not as bad as I think. And uh, then say, show your resume, show your cover letter to uh, these Discord servers. Usually, uh, a lot of the servers uh, have asked for feedback. We have it on our Discord server. So you're welcome to post that. And there are a lot of servers as well. You can ask, get feedback, improve on it. And then I know it's scary, but prepare it, apply. You're either not gonna hear back, you're, which, which happens even for people with experience, you're gonna hear a rejection, which is something you need to be uh, like good at handling. So every rejection is like a muscle train. Take it like this, every rejection is you training yourself. Okay, now I got a rejection, I'll get past it. So I'm stronger next time. With every rejection, you will get better. I would recommend, uh, have you heard of the 100 day rejection challenge? No. Okay, that, that, it, this idea came from a guy who started saying, I think a week or three days, he tries to get rejected every day. So he would ask something ridiculous, uh, a random girl on a train, can I get your number? Don't do that, please, maybe <laughs> it's come out harassment, but that's what he did. Or the, he would go and ask crazy requests with the goal of getting rejected, rejected. So he would ask politely, he would try to ask again and see if there is a way to get it. And assuming he would get rejected, two things. First of all, with every rejection, he builds more confidence and ability to handle rejection. Second of all, you would be surprised how many times he actually got a yes. For example, he went to a donut shop and he said, I want donuts on the Olympic, for the Olympics. And the woman there at the shop actually went out of her way to try to create something. And he was shocked and he actually got it and he got it for free. He was excited that he asked for something different. Uh, so if you search 100 day rejection challenge on YouTube or I can, just email me, I'll send it to you later as well, if you can't find it. I keep watching this, these videos, and it gives you confidence about how to handle rejection. Handling rejection is extremely important in every uh, industry, and the job industry, especially when you're just starting, it's gonna happen. So the sooner you face it, the better. Uh, I would say, watch these videos and try to see how he's handling it. Every rejection builds more muscle for you to get better and improve, especially, especially if you get feedback, improve on it and keep going at it. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, uh, is that a no? Uh, Vladimir, or are you with us? Uh, well, 
Okay, if you have no more questions, then uh, I'm not sure if I should wait for Vladimir or she doesn't seem to be here. Uh, I think she's gone. Okay, <laughs> I see her, but she's gone. All right. Uh, any other questions? Anything else I can help with? Well, you gave us so so much info that uh, I, I hope at so. least yeah, at least for me, uh, everything's clear. All right. Yeah, thank uh, you very much for the talk. I hope it was helpful. And if you have any questions, if someone is not comfortable asking here, this is my email. It's Bashar at kumasgamejobs.com. Please reach out to me. No problem at all. I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, other than that, thanks a lot for joining, and I wish you a good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you very much. Good, good night. night. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Good night. Have a nice evening. You too. Good night.